The Olympics today are arguably the most prestigious sporting event in the world. For the ancient Greeks, however, the Olympic Games were not just a sporting event, they were one of the most important religious, political and cultural events in the Hellenic world. There were other Pan-Hellenic Games held each year in a cycle, but the Olympics even back then were the most prestigious, as shown by the fact that each four-year period was called an Olympiad. In this episode, we shall look at how ancient Olympic Games were conducted. Not everyone can be an athlete and compete in the Olympics, but being healthy in your daily life is a goal that's achievable if you're using the sponsor of this video, Noom. Noom is a program that combines the power of technology with the empathy of real human coaches to deliver successful behavior change and sustainable weight loss results. The main historian of our channel has been using Noom for six months now, and in this period has lost more than 20 kilograms, that's 50 pounds, by building healthy habits. And you can do it too, by taking your free 30 second quiz using our link in the description and get started today. But how did Noom help our colleague? After you take its quiz, it creates your personalized program and aids you to achieve your goal by spending just 10 minutes using it daily. It tracks meals and calories, water intake, steps you take, calorie density, and more giving you an analysis at the end of the day, which makes you aware of what you do right on the way to your goals. Each user gets a personal coach trained in psychology and nutrition who motivates and keeps you on track. It's all about building good habits using cognitive behavior therapy as Noom creates long-term results through habit and behavior change, not restrictive dieting. It has helped more than 1.5 million people already and will certainly help you. Support our channel and your healthy lifestyle. Take your free 30 second quiz using our link in the description and get started today. The origins of the Olympic Games are ambiguous, and some of the mythical explanations include that an archaic race of men raced for a young Zeus to entertain him, starting the tradition, that Pelops, after killing King Oenomaus by replacing his bronze chariot pins with pins made of beeswax, instituted the games as thanksgiving for his victory and funeral games for Oenomaus. Lastly, that Heracles began the games after the completion of his 12 labors. The Eleans, who hosted the games at Olympia, gave a more historical explanation, in which Iphitos of Elis, Cleisthenes of Pisa, and Lycurgus of Sparta founded the games after it was decreed by the Delphic Oracle. Two things can be stated as fact that the Olympics' roots were deep in Greece's past, and that they were a highly religious event. Aristotle claimed the first Olympics were held in 776 BC, although some archaeological evidence suggests a date of closer to the 9th century BC. The first written record of competitive games in Greek culture is in Homer's Iliad, when huge funeral games were held to honor the dead Patroclus. Funeral games like these were practiced throughout the Mycenaean world, and were likely from where the Olympic Games originated. Olympia, where the games were held, was predominantly under the authority of the city of Elis, though it changed hands a number of times. It was briefly conquered by the Archives at some point in the 8th or 7th century, before being returned to the Eleans, and again around 644 BC by the Pisetans. The Pisetans managed to hold the city for approximately 70 years before it was reclaimed by the Eleans, supported by Sparta. The narrative of Iphitos of Elis, Cleosthenes of Pisa, and Lycurgus of Sparta founding the games probably stems from that event. In 365 BC, the Arcadians formed a confederacy to challenge the Spartans, took the city from the Eleans, and prepared to host the games. During the games, the Eleans suddenly arrived with a sizable force. The Arcadian Confederation had gathered a similar force, positioning themselves on the banks of the river Cladios. In a fierce battle, the Eleans managed to push across the river and force the Arcadians further and further back into Olympia. They eventually withdrew, but heavy casualties forced the Arcadians to return Olympia to Elis. Though the actual events of the Games were held at the end of July or start of August, the Olympic truce was announced two months prior. The truce, or Echecera, is often misinterpreted or misunderstood as a universal ceasefire between the Greek city-states. In reality, 
the truce had three main conditions. Firstly, that the entirety of the state of Elis, to which Olympia belonged, was considered sacrosanct for the duration, and no armies could enter its borders. Secondly, that any athlete, spectator, delegate, or any other kind of participant in the games could not be harmed or harassed, even if they had to pass through a state that their home country was at war with. Thirdly, all the states who swore to the truce would oppose any other that broke it. Elis sent special envoys, Theroi or Spondophoroi, to the largest centers of Greece to announce the truce. It would last four months, giving people enough time to travel to and from the games. While the swearing to this truce was optional, the prestige of the Olympics was so great, the states rarely refused. Strabo tells us that any army wishing to march through during the truce would hand their weapons to Elean authorities at the border and had them handed back once they had passed through. Because the truce only came into effect when the Eleans announced it in a particular city, some cities entered the truce sooner than others. In 420 BC, for instance, the Spartans invaded southern Elis, taking a part of it. The Eleans were furious and imposed a fine, saying that the Echechira had been announced, and that the Spartans had therefore broken the truce. The Spartans countered this accusation, saying that the envoys had not yet reached them, and the truce had not been announced in Sparta. Nevertheless, the Eleans banned the Spartans, who held their own separate games to honor Zeus that year instead. The provision that attendees of the games not be harmed is less understood. It is probable that athletes, escorts, fans and others going to the games would travel in groups protected by the rules of Xenia, the moral obligation that hosts had to treat guests hospitably, rules that were sacred to Zeus, the protector of guests and strangers. It is likely that, as the participants were en route to the games that honoured Zeus, attacking them would have been blasphemous. This truce allowed the Olympics to be held, even during the chaos of the Peloponnesian War. But as mentioned, Greek city-states did still fight each other and conduct military operations. Basically, the Echechira only guaranteed that fighting did not impede the Olympics or threaten those who were partaking in the games. For Greeks, the distinction between amateur and professional athletes didn't exist. The word athletes simply meaning one who competes. Some states subsidized the training, but this was not required, there being no athletic qualifications needed to compete. There were, however, other requirements. The athletes had to be male, belong to one of the Greek tribes, be free, and had to be legitimate children. Certain crimes, particularly murder, would exclude one from being able to compete. Upon arriving at the games, they would have to announce their father, tribe, and other prerequisites to a panel of judges. A judge or contestants could demand that a contender prove certain attributes, as Alexander I of Macedon famously had to do when his Greek lineage was called into question. So long as these requirements were met, however, the games were open to all. The list of Olympic victors consists of people from all walks of life, from a number of kings such as Philip II of Macedon, to cooks such as Koroibos of Elis, thought to be the first Olympic victor. Married women could not even be spectators to the games, possibly because the Greeks thought it improper for married women to watch naked men. Young girls and unmarried women, somewhat confusingly, however, could watch the games. There was one exception to the rule, as chariot racing was an expensive sport, requiring a huge amount of money to buy and maintain horses, every chariot was owned by a sponsor. This sponsor could be an entire city-state or a wealthy individual, including a woman. If the chariot won the race, it was the sponsor who was considered the victor. Thus, the first female Olympic victor was Kiniska of Sparta, who won the four-horse chariot race in 396 BC. All athletes were required to reach Olympia four weeks before the start of the Games for training in the gymnasium. This was an opportunity to practice, but could also be thought of as a qualifying stage. As the athletes trained, judges observed them and decided who would compete in the Games themselves. Contestants could be ruled out, 
either for simply not being good enough or for cheating. If someone was caught cheating, a small bronze statue of Zeus was erected with the cheater's name, offense and punishments inscribed underneath to dissuade others from following their example. While training, athletes would be housed in special accommodation, the Leonidion. Spectators, on the other hand, were not provided with accommodation and probably slept under the stars or in tents. Even though the actual sporting events had not yet begun, there still would have been plenty of activities to keep them entertained. Olympia has been a crucial political and religious site since approximately 1000 BC. There were a number of important temples on the site, including the Temple of Hera, the Pelopion, dedicated to the hero Pelops, and most famous of all, the Temple of Zeus. It was inside this temple that one of the ancient wonders of the world, the colossal statue of Zeus, made by the master sculptor Phidias, stood. Rituals would have been performed throughout the weeks leading up to the games. The Pritaneion, where the priests and magistrates for the festival resided, also housed the hearth of Hestia. Hearths were incredibly important for the Greeks, symbolizing community, and fire from this hearth would have been taken to other temples at Olympia for use in various rituals. It is from this that the modern idea of the Olympic flame originates, although unlike other Greek games, the Olympics did not have a relay of the torch. With people across Greece convened in one place, the Olympics were also a perfect location for alliances to be publicly announced and sealed by sacrifices. It was also the ideal opportunity for delegates from allied states to get together in one place to discuss plans. There were also more symbolic politics at work. Greek city-states would dedicate riches to the treasuries in Olympia as conspicuous displays of their wealth, and would even have spoils displayed here, memorializing victories over fellow Greeks and foreigners alike. One of the most notable examples of these is that of the Athenian general Miltiades, victor of the Battle of Marathon, whose inscribed helmet was found at the Athenian treasury in Olympia. The games were also an ideal time for poets, artists and sculptors who would have displayed and recited their works, hoping to catch the attention of a wealthy patron. Many of these artists would also be commissioned after the games had been concluded to commemorate victors. One of the most famous examples of such an artist is Pindar, whose victory odes are considered some of the most impressive examples of Greek lyric poetry. Once training was complete, the actual games would begin. The athletes selected to compete and the judges would have all sworn oaths in front of a statue of Zeus in the Buluterion, Council House of Olympia. When the Olympics were first conceived, there was only one event, the Stadion, and the games only lasted a day. By the 5th century, many other events had been added and the games now stretched over five days. Some of the contests were very similar to ones held in the modern Olympics and were done almost identically, others were much more grueling. The Stadion remained the most prestigious event, similar to the 100 meter sprint in modern Olympics, and an Olympiad would be named after the victor of the Stadion. The race took place in an arena called a Stadion from where the race got its name, and from where we get the modern word Stadium. More foot races were added over time, such as a double stadion, approximately 400 meters, and the dolikos, the long distance event consisting of about 12.5 laps of the stadion, roughly 4,800 meters. The most peculiar of foot races, however, was the hoplitodromos, the hoplite race. Introduced in 520 BC, it would have been the last foot race event, and it had the same length as the dialos, but with each runner wearing a helmet, greaves and the hoplon shield for a total weight of around 10 kilograms, although some modern estimates suggest nearer 22 kilograms, so the race was a true test of strength and stamina. Interestingly, the roots of the hoplitodromos may well have been in Greek military strategy. By 520 BC, the Greeks had already begun clashing with the Persians, notably in Ionia. Persian armies often included large numbers of archers, and with the traditional Greek style of fighting being based on heavily armed infantry, 
closing distance quickly would have been an important skill for Greek armies. A clear example of the Greeks using such a tactic against the Persians is the Battle of Marathon, where the Greek Hoplite force charged the Persians over a distance of perhaps 200 meters. Another event with similar roots in Greek military training was the Pentathlon. Held over one day, contestants would first race a stadion, then throw a javelin, a discus, then would long jump, and finally wrestle. The javelin and discus throw would have been conducted similarly to how they are today. The long jump, however, was done from a standing start, used weights in each hand for greater momentum, and consisted of multiple jumps. Wrestling was an important part of Greek culture, and was a separate event in its own right as well. The objective was to score three points, which could be done by either forcing an opponent's back to touch the ground, forcing an opponent to tap out or concede, or forcing them out of the circle. Hitting, kicking, eye gouging, biting and attacking the opponent's genitals were banned. The techniques used in wrestling were all considered vital for hoplites who would have practiced in these events. The most brutal of events at the Olympics was undoubtedly the Pancration, a combination of boxing and wrestling. The only rules were no eye gouging and no biting, and the modern comparison would be MMA, with punches, kicks, chokes, arm locks and grappling all being allowed. Even the Greeks considered it an extremely dangerous sport, and there are numerous examples of a competition ending in death. It was also one of the most popular sports for spectators, and eight of Pindar's odes are to Pancratian champions. The rich aristocracy was particularly prolific in the equine events held in the Hippodrome. Events ranged from simple horse racing to two and four horse chariot races to mule cart racing. The Olympic victors of these events included many kings, notably Philip II of Macedon, who won three separate equine events. Entire communities could also be victors, such as the Archives, who were victors of the four-horse chariot race in 472 BC, presumably meaning that the people of Argos had gathered together to fund a chariot team. The driver of the chariot was usually a hired professional and did not have to be from the same city-state. The Stadion, Wrestling, Boxing and even the Pancration also had separate contests specifically for boys under 18. There were no weight classes or age divisions, and the rules were no different for these events. Given the fact that deaths in adult boxing and Pancration are both recorded in ancient sources, there is probably a grim reality that at least some boys competing met a similar fate. On the fifth final day of the games, the victors were announced. There was only one per competition, with no prizes for second or third, the only official prize for the victor being a crown of olive. Olympic victors could expect to receive huge rewards from their home state, however, as such victory was seen as a national achievement. Victors could often have statues erected in their cities, odes composed for them, and possibly even cults established posthumously to praise them. In Athens, victors were housed and fed luxuriously by the state. They were widely admired throughout the Hellenic world and were powerful political tools, often being sent to other states as a sign of friendship and to rally support for their city. Poleus looking to establish new colonies would occasionally send a victor to the newly established city in order to entice others into following their example. Perhaps even more importantly, the names of the victors were all recorded at the Buluterion in Olympia, and substantial lists of Olympic victors have survived until today. In many ways, the ancient Olympic Games were a microcosm of Greek culture, a combination of athletics, artistry, politics and religion. At times civilized and honorable, as seen by the oaths of fairness taken and the punishment of cheaters, while at other times being quite brutal, as with the boys Pancratian and boxing. The games could be held under a deeply religious truce, preventing violence against attendees of the games, while at the same time the entirety of Greece was embroiled in brutal warfare against each other. The games were symbolic of a united idea of Hellenism, 
but at the same time states would proudly display their spoils of victory taken from other Greeks at their treasuries. The games were open to all who wished to enter, with no prohibitions of athletic ability or class, while banning those of the wrong sex or genealogy. Despite their flaws, there are many lessons to be taken from the ancient Olympics, lessons about unity, fair play, and celebrating the achievements of humanity, all of which have inspired the modern Olympic Games. More videos on Greek history are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description, to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.